the. It does not have any affiliation with that word. We, the people. Can an independent be elected to the federal office in the United States or a federal office representing a state without facing an undaunted, unbiased task. I have contemplated running for office 2024. I acted in 2004 seeking the federal executive office as an independent, but I can't obtain ballot access. I wrote a letter to the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist in 2004 asking to accept my petition. The clerk precluded me more than once mandating that I should be relegated to a lower district court. Properly, the argument belongs before the United States Supreme Court because properly, a party to the lawsuit is every state in the union. To my, to my knowledge, the five commonwealths of the United States have not been granted the right to elect a federal executive. I did finally file in 2011 in the U.S. Northern District Court, Yeager v. the State of Alabama, et al. But I filed a 38-page petition. I went after the state codes. The state cannot have a right on the federal government. They are an object under the federal government. They are subject to, but they are writing codes for the federal executive office. That crosses every boundary line in the state union. So I made a, a summation. X percent of signatures, and I put the X in quotes, regarding their codes regarding petitions. And this may not seem like an exciting video, a better government than it is necessary to listen to arguments that are not intended to inflame your mentality. One of them. This is a way that we would present in a court of law, arguing the facts. That petition, that 38 page petition was not accepted by the court. It, it instructed that I should cite the code. So I corrected the deficiencies and I refiled in February of 2012, a 739 page petition, 500 pages citing state code. I'm indigent, but I'm smart. I also chose not to side with any political party because I believe in union. I believe that as an independent, you're looking at the argument, not the person bringing the argument, not the faction that they want to belong to. In a faction, in a mob or a group, they are either dictated to what they want to believe, or what they should believe, to obtain something such as a job, basic amenities, housing, the right to work, the right to associate, the right of medical access, and the list can go on and on. And typically in this country, as we have learned from the old world, there are two factions, the rich and the poor. And this divides our country because we are comprised of both. So it would be easy to side with a political party. But the day I'm running across the decision whether I would consider running for U.S. Senate, I don't know yet. I've contemplated it. 
have contemplated remaking the argument for the federal executive office. Making the argument that as an independent, can you achieve office? That was the first question. Telling you what I've done. That's the second instance that there is a great obstruction to the federal executive. And now in my own state in Ohio, I'm looking at whether there's still an obstruction, a great obstruction, and an unconstitutional one towards running for the U.S. Senate. Just looking over what I would have to do. I downloaded the 2024 Ohio candidate guideline. When I looked to the section that said U.S. Senate, it is governed by Ohio Revised Code 3513.07. Strike that. 3513.05. And 3513.257. I started to look at some of that code. There needs to be clarity in code. There's too much going on inside a code. For example, one of the codes I just cited without having to go back and look at it. As I was reading it, it said, except for joint, if you're going for governor and lieutenant governor, and then it would go on and have some other exceptions. Once you start an exception, it's clear you're going to start confusion and you need to have a separate code. It's not a separate code for a different object. If one object is the U.S. Senate, that's a code. If another object is the lieutenant governor and governor, that's a code. If another object is a district board, that's a code. But it causes you to read a great deal of irrelevant wording. This is why I don't like making videos. It's an editing process that's going to take me five hours. I could spend the five hours. Right. So under the Ohio candidate requirement guideline for the United States Senate, Regarding the petitions, if you belong to a major party, all you need to do is gather a thousand signatures. That doesn't. Next, we go to the protection of a minor party. Their task is even less, 500 signatures. What would you say should be the requirement then of an independent? It should be even less than a minor party. In fact, it's more than even the major party. Five times greater a chore. It's impunitive. An independent must gather 5,000 signatures in the state of Ohio for the United States Senate. That's a lot of time, gas, and affiliation. Who writes the code? Typically, the two major political parties write the code. What is the objective of the political party? If you went to look at their website, I've done this in the past, I put this in my Jaeger v. State of Alabama argument. They blatantly say on their website their objective is to hold every office in the country all the way down to the lowly township clerk. People want to talk about communism. They want to talk about monarchies and dynasties and how we want to get away from that. But we've created the same atmosphere inside the United States. That is elitism. After that, they complain that anybody who wants to run for office, and this has been said from George W. Bush on down, you're taking my vote. First, every citizen holds a right to vote and it is not captive or forced or entitled to a candidate, nor is it reserved. 
You can register with a political party, but you don't have to vote political party. So I turn to the Federalist Papers because this is the argument making our Constitution. And it brought up that in Federalist Paper 57. The federal representatives, not the rich more than the poor, not the learned more than the ignorant, not the haughty heirs of distinguished names, more than the sons of obscure and unpropitious fortune. Who are the objects? Every citizen whose merit may recommend him to the esteem of the confidence of his country. No qualification of wealth, of birth, of religious faith or civil profession is permitted to fetter the judgment or disappoint the inclination of the people. Now that says, if I'm poor and I want to run for office, I shouldn't be forced to go find somebody else to give me money for gas or go find a bunch of other people to say, would you help me gather 5,000 signatures for the U.S. Senate? Or if I were going to run for the federal executive to do that in every state. People are sleeping homeless in these United States. Cold, hungry, impoverished. Many of us anymore don't even own homes. The list goes on, but these haughty heirs of distinguished names, to quote Federalist Paper 57, would today be declared to be the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, anybody who's climbed their way through any elected office repetitively. When it came to the federal executive office, the Senate crossed their branch right to put qualifications on the federal executive by limiting the term in office, why they themselves are unlimited. The federal executive may only hold office for eight years, two consecutive four-year terms. But I look at my own state house and I see people who've made careers jumping from position to position to position. Even my governor of this state has been in the state house, then in the federal government, and then is holding another office in the state. He has been a career, do I say politician or statesman? I'm not sure what is, is fitting. I'm really not even sure that Mr. DeWine is governor of the state because I stopped watching government a few years ago. It disheartens me like it disheartens many people, which comes back to this idea when you have a passion and a zeal and you have ideas and you want to move these forward, which may be a solution to help all of us. Office is where you need to go. But to get to that office, you have this preclusion by the people who have already stated they want to hold every office. I think that's called tyranny plus anarchy. Certainly not a representative government, but it's representative of a government with an ellipsis. That is the three dots that say, we're a republic, dot, dot, dot. And then you would not hear what they mean by we're a republic. So I'm looking around at Federalist Paper 57 and a few other relevant quotes just, just to broach on this subject. Men who profess the most flaming zeal for Republican government yet 
boldly impeach the fundamental principles of it. That is exactly what we're talking about when you put a very high hurdle on someone who is low. Hi, I'm just an independent. I'm not affiliated with anybody. I want to run for office. I don't have any money. If I have to go get a job, I'm going to work there 40 hours a week. I'm going to be excessively tired. And then I can't achieve the other objectives for this office, which is a full-time work campaigning. And in order to campaign, you're going to have to ask other people for the money out of their pocket, which they need. That is to impeach the very fundamental of a Republican government, which is our representatives come from the people, not the elite of this country, not the millionaires, not the businessmen, not the political party people, but the people, the it does not have any affiliation with that word. We, the people. Beneath that paragraph, boldly impeach the fundamental principles that some unreasonable qualification of property was annexed to the right of suffrage or that the eligibility was limited to persons of particular families or fortunes. Qualification of property must then attach itself to a petition signature. You must own a title, a petition. It must have legal signatures on it of persons of certain age who are registered to vote who say, yes, you may be on this ballot. I have to get consent from the people who have said we're going to vote in an election or we have voted within the last four years and we would like to continue our right of suffrage to vote. But for you to be on a ballot, to not waste ink, you better have our approval. Now that is also facing a fundamental principle of the United States Constitution. It is putting a minority in this case, a very elite minority, atop of the majority. I'm going to move back to the right of suffrage before I end. So I found this interesting, and I don't know exactly what 5,000 citizens means in the time of the 1700s, or if it was just a speculative number. They're talking about a majority and minority. That was basically the inference, and whether... They had to use 3,000 or 4,000 or 2,000 or 10,000, depending on what a state has. The number here is irrelevant, but it does touch on a similar number for me to gather signatures required by the state of Ohio for the U.S. Senate. That five or 6,000 citizens are less capable of choosing a fit representative or more liable to be corrupted by an unfit one than five or 600. So they're saying, can the majority be more liable to be corrupted? In a sense, yes, because today they use these little emotional buttons, abortion that comes up every year, abortion button. They want you to get out and vote. They want you to choose, give up everything else that across the board to put that one political party member who is inflaming your zeal so that regardless of everything else that they may exist for, which has a great weight, you're going to ignore all that, drop it for that one emotional button. That is not advised. The right of suffrage. We must not deprive the people of their immediate choice and their public servant. And yet we do this by saying, well, you could have that person if they can achieve that goal. And now you need to promise to us by all this time and money involved in making these 5,000 signatures that you may elect them. And yet, would that not require you as as a citizen desiring 
to hold office, to campaign for office before you're even on the ballot. I've met people like that. When I petitioned to be mayor of Carrollton, I met a guy who decided he didn't want, he wanted to know what I was going to campaign on before he would even sign the petition. Now, you have the right when someone's on the ballot after hearing a whole bunch of debate to change your mind about that, do you not? So why say that I'm going to have somebody sign a petition so that I can be on the ballot, campaign for me ahead of time, I might not like you, I might like you later. They don't know because we're not on the ballot, we're not campaigning yet. But I'm going to have to make this argument to people to get on the ballot. This is ridiculous. This is a minority holding a majority hostage to elitism. So let's say that I did, these people do like me. And then later on they decide, I'm not going to vote for you. Is not the argument of the state failed in that capacity? We don't know the outcome of an election yet, but we are trying to predetermine it and truly tailor it so it's advantageous to the political parties who write the law that restrain you from public office. And that is its unconstitutional failure per the United States Constitution. A press release from the Ohio Secretary of State, October 1st, 2021. Titled, The Secretary of State Provides an update on the party affiliation data. This is the registered voters in the state of Ohio. This, this is the data, why I am subject to so much higher criteria or the state would be wasting their ink. According to this, there are 7.9 million registered voters in the state of Ohio, almost 8 million. Of that 8 million, Less than a million are registered as Democrats. They have the higher number, 947,000 plus. Republicans are holding at about 836,000 plus. The Libertarian Party has nearly 3,000, 2,847. So in context with that, we've hit about 3 million people. The unaffiliated, those who choose not to associate with either party, major or minor, the unaffiliated, that is my criteria. 6.1 million people, almost 6.2 million people. The actual number is 6,196,000 plus. So, is this the state argument that says... The bottom essence is to prove that for me to prove that I am worthy to be on a ballot so the state, the taxpayers can print my name. Of this past year, when I labored full time and then I took my two days off, not only trying to recuperate from that labor, but to do the necessity of my regular life, there is no time to put in holding a petition somewhere or driving someplace to hold up a petition for people to say, I don't want to get involved in this because the political party climate itself is becoming an agitation. I haven't yet declared I'm running for office because in 2024, because I'm still contemplating the investment necessary to even make the ballot. I have the mentality. I have the heart. But there is a great hurdle in my way that should not be there. And so I'm asking the people. You can start commenting down below. I, everyone wants to get down to that last presidential debate. And then you all hang around the water cooler arguing about the madness that goes on in that. And it is very, it becomes heated because there's a lot of millions of dollars funding these political candidates. I don't know what kind of deals are made in, the, in that instance. 
but you don't stick a lot of money behind somebody and then are angered when they fail to win. But I would like to run. I keep trying to go that way. That's a nice quiet life. Let me just go over here and be by myself. But what happens for me is in my heart and in my mind, I continue to turn back and hear the clamor for what I do as a writer philosopher for many, many years is try to find solution, some common sense, something that propel people mentally, soulfully forward. But one, this is not, these are not offices that you just decide. I want to go. It takes a lot. And for me, the obstacle makes me lose some heart. It's so much work just to make the ballot. It takes work from the campaign and then it'll take work from the office. I don't want to be drained mentally and soulfully if I were elected to office that I couldn't perform in that office. Because this is why we have problems in our country. We are not a republic, a representative of the people. Coming back to that word, the. Mr. Kai. There's a fly in the window and actually it turns out to be Miss Keeley. It's chasing it. I know you're engineered to chase down Berman. Let's go look at her for a second. Tails wagging, it bothers you.